So today we're going to look at section 6.6, which is talking about work. And um, if you've had any physics class, you know that uh, work was work equals force times distance. You might remember that. <clears throat> well, if you're moving it along a along a fixed a fixed distance or a, along a distance, what we can do we can use calculate calculus to calculate the work over a distance that you um, by through summation we can just add up all the distances. So again, we're going to get that integral is going to come into play. Uh, in this class, in this section, uh, talking about the work around, if you want to compute the work along a directed um, distance along the x-axis. Okay, so we will go ahead and start with the lesson. It says Hooke's law for springs is the force that it takes to stretch or compress a single spring x, a single spring x unit. There probably should be a comma right there. X length units from its natural unstressed, unstressed length is proportional to X. And so whenever you have that direct um, proportionality, you can, um, Y equals KX is kind of the direct variation. But here, since it's force, it's F equals KX is your equation. And the constant K is measured in force units per unit length is a characteristic of the spring called the force or the spring constant of the spring. And Hooke's law gives a good result as long as the force doesn't distort the metal in the spring, which is what we will assume for these problems. Okay, so obviously if you mess up your spring, then this isn't going to work. And we also have um, this definition for work. Um, you may remember from a basic physics class, work is equal to force times distance. Um, but if you, if you want to know the work done by a variable force directed along the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b, then um, you need to use an integral. And so kind of what you can think of the difference where your force may vary is if, the, if you're pulling up, like say you're pulling up a bucket full of water, well you have obviously the force required to lift the bucket it's going to be constant because the bucket, if, as long as none of the water is splashing out or anything, it's just going to have the same weight, you know, weight. But where, um, you know, you have force is equal to mass times acceleration, and so, you know, you can get this weight that you have. But you also have the weight of the rope if you're pulling it, you know, up high, and that weight's going to be variable because as you pull, if you're using a pulley system, as you pull the rope up towards you, you have less rope that less work to do because you don't have to lift the rope as much or chain or whatever it is that you're doing. So this um, integral kind of deals with working with or thinking about having that variable force in addition to the, the weight force that you have on whatever it is that you're trying to move. Okay, so uh, let's look at our first example. It says, a force of two newtons will stretch a rubber band two centimeters which uh, is 0.02 meters. And you do, on these problems, you do kind of want to pay attention to your units because that units can really make you, um, get you into some trouble. Okay, assuming that Hooke's law applies, how far will a four Newton force stretch the rubber band? And then how much work does it take to stretch the rubber band this far? Okay, so the first thing we want to do on this problem is to go and figure out, go ahead and figure out our constant of variation. So according to Hooke's law, we know that F is equal to KX. And we're told that a force of 2 newtons will stretch a rubber band 0.02 meters. And we do need to be in meters for this um, unit. Okay, and so we can plug that, or for this problem, we can plug that in and we can say 2 newtons is equal to K times 0.02 meters and then we can divide by 0.02 meters and um, we get, this is two, two hundredths, right? And so if you flip it, the twos cancel and you just get 100 uh, Newton meters. Okay, now so then this says, now the question is, assuming that Hooke's law applies, how far will a 4 Newton st force stretch the rubber band? Okay, so now we have this general formula. Now that we know what K is, 
we have that F is equal to 100 newton meters times K, I'm sorry, times X. So we can solve for, um, for this, for X, if, where X is how far, we'll put 4 in here. And if you put 100 newton meters, I know the physicists and the scientists always love for you to use your units because then you can see things canceling. When you divide both sides by 100, um, so you'll have 4. Dividing by 100 is like multiplying by the reciprocal. So this is be um, 1 meter over 100 newtons. Um, and these are newtons. So you can see the newtons canceling, and you get 4 hundredths is equal to x. So 0 0.04 uh, meters will be equal to x. Okay? which, of course, if you want to go back to the original units, is 4 centimeters. Okay, now it says, uh, how much work does it take to stretch the rubber band this far? Okay, well, according to this definition, work is a force, a, the force over the directed distance here, their dx. So we are going to just um, take this formula, F equals kx, because that's our force, but we have we know what k is. It's 0.04. I'm sorry, we know k is 100, and the distance that we want to move it is 0.04. So we're going to integrate from zero to 0.04, and then um, k x dx, where our k is 100 x dx. And you can do this either with your calculator or your brain. Uh, this will be 100 x squared over 2, evaluated between 0 and 0.04. And if you uh, type that in correctly, you should get 0.08. And does anybody know the unit for work when you're in the metric system? Remember that? It's a joule. Okay. So that's a joule. Okay? All right, so that was fun, huh? <coughs> so the spring ones, they're not so bad. So let's try another one, sort of like a spring, but it's um, dealing with, uh, well, it's still a spring problem because it's dealing with the, a subway. I guess they have springs on them, I don't, I don't know, at the edge of the, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really familiar with the makings of a subway, but a subway car, but anyway. It says it takes a force of 21,714 pounds to compress a coil spring assembly on a New York City Transit Authority subway car from its free height of 8 inches to its fully compressed height of 5 inches. So I guess they, they sit on springs or something. I don't know. Sounds good. Okay. So... Um, the first thing they ask is, what is the assembly's force constant? And that's really, they're looking for the spring constant. Okay, so we know the formula is F equals K times X. And you have to be um, uh, kind of thinking here. Your force that they give you is 21,714. And then we were looking for K, but what is X? X is the distance. And it goes from 8 inches to a fully compressed height of 5 inches. So this really is going to be, the distance is really 3, or 8 minus 5. Does that make sense? So we have 21,714 equals 3K. And then in order to solve for K, all we have to do is um, divide both sides by 3. And we get 7,238 pounds per inch. Okay, so that is your um, force constant. Okay, I guess this should have been a B, but I don't know what happened. Okay. 
says, how much work does it take to compress the assembly the first half inch and then the first, um, and, and then the second half inch answer to the nearest inch pound? So if you've ever had any, if you had any experience with a string, I mean with a spring, you know, like, you can get it down part way, but then it takes more effort to push it further, right? So you would expect the second half inch will probably be heavier than, the, or harder to do than the first. <coughs> Let's see. Um, so we have our work, and we want to know how far is it that we're going to be compressing it. We want the first half inch. So our limits are going to be from 0 to 0 0.5, okay? Now, it's K, it's force um, dx, right? But here our force, because we're dealing with a spring, is K times x. And we found our K to be 7,238. So we're just going to integrate from 0 to 0 0.5, 7,238 x dx. And if you, uh, you can do this either with your calculator or your brain, x squared over 2, and plug in your 0.5, and you should get approximately 905 inch pounds. If you, uh, yep, I trust that you can do that, okay, with either your calculator or your brain. All right, now, um, the second half inch... You, now your integral is going to go from uh, 0.5 to 1, okay? Still going to have 7,238 and then x dx. So this will be 7,238 x squared over 2 evaluated from 1 to 0.5. And if you do that, either with your calculator or your, and these are approximate, I rounded it to the nearest inch pound, um, you're going to get approximately 2,714 inch pounds. So it's substantially more challenging to go on the second half than the first. Like, I don't think I could do it. I guess they have engines or something. <laughs> Plus the car weighs a lot. Okay. Okay. So now let's move, that, those are kind of your spring questions. These, these problems, these work questions, they kind of fall into three categories. There's the, the spring, and then there's the moving a bucket elevator quest, chain question, and then there's the moving a fluid, <coughs> uh, pumping a fluid out of a tank. Those are the three types of work questions that we'll be dealing with. So this next two examples are going to be dealing with either a chain or, you know, a rope that you're pulling up or something like that. So example three says, a mountain climber is about to haul up a 50 meter length of hanging rope. How much work will it take if the rope weighs uh, 0.624 Newton meters? Okay. So um, the force, remember for this integral, we need force times Distance. Now, the force required uh, to haul up the rope is equal to the rope's weight. But obviously, you should be able to see that that weight is going to vary at any moment because you're going to have less and less as you're pulling it up. So this varies steadily. And is proportional to uh, x the length of the rope still hanging.
right? So if we just let X be amount that's still hanging, then we should, we'll have this. We obviously should say at any, at any point, if we take, if the weight of the rope is 0.624, if we multiply that by X, um, we'll know how much <clears throat> we have. So the force is going to be 0.624, sorry, times X, where X is how much you have left. And so our integral is going to be the integral from 0 to 50 of F of X, which is 0.624 X dx. So this really this this is really how much, you can think of this at any instant, it's the weight of the rope that you have there, if X is the uh, length of the rope still hanging. Okay, and so if you compute this, 0.624 X squared over 2 from 0 to 50, you get that the work is going to be 780. And in this case, we're dealing in English units, the Newton, Newton meters, I mean, uh, and so we, we call that a joule. Those, those, aren't, those are metric units, the Newton meter, which we'll call it a joule. Okay. So now let's look at example four, which is similar to the third one. It says, an electric elevator with a motor at the top has a multi-strand cable weighing 4.5 pounds per foot. When the car is at the first floor, 180 feet of cable are paid out, which I guess is like paid out meaning, you, you know, all the way out. And effectively, zero feet are out when the car is at the top floor. How much work does the motor do just lifting the cable when it takes the car from the first floor to the top floor? So you've got this elevator. If it's on the bottom floor, then this distance, this is 180 feet of cable, right? But as it moves up, the cable, you're going to have less cable that it has to move. Okay. So what you want to do is you, you need to figure out the force first in order to use this work uh, integral. So the force required to haul up the rope is equal to the rope's weight, oh, I'm looking at rope and I should be saying cable. The force required to haul, uh, I guess we're, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong, to lift the cable. The force required to lift the cable is equal to the weight, to the weight of the cable paid out, however much you have out. Okay, and so what is the weight of the cable? Well, it's 4.5 pounds per foot, but depending on where you are, you, you know, you need your length. And so all the way out is 180, and then you subtract just where, whatever distance you are, like how high you are up. So like if, if here you're at, if this is X, say that's 20, then it's just going to be 180, I mean, sorry, 4.5 4 times 160. So your force depends on where you are. Okay? And so <coughs> here our X is the position of the car off the first floor. or the elevator. Off the first floor. 
So are you 20 feet off or 100 feet off or wherever you are? Okay. So now it should be pretty straightforward to set up our inner goal. How far is it that we want to move this elevator? Well, they told us they want to know how much work does the motor do just lifting the cable when it takes the car from the first floor to the top. So we want to go from zero, essentially zero, to 180. We want to lift the entire cable. And um, our formula, it's f of x dx, so it's 4.5 times 180 minus x dx. And you can work this one out with your calculator or your brain. Put your 4.5 out front, I would. Actually, you can go ahead and integrate it. So that's going to be 180x minus x squared over 2, evaluated between 0 and 180. So we'll just plug 180 in, and we'll plug um, 0 in. Obviously, it's going to be 0. And so it's just going to be 4.5 times, this was kind of fun, because here's a whole 180 squared and here's half, so it's just going to be 180 squared divided by 2, I think, um, which is going to be, if you type that into your calculator, you should get 72,900 foot pounds. Okay. The last few problems we look at like how much work it takes to um, hit a tennis ball at a certain speed or a, a, a golf ball at a certain speed. So then if you have any understanding of that, maybe you'll have an understanding of how much this is. <laughs> you know, it seems like a lot, but obviously it's a pretty heavy engine. Okay, um, now we're going to look at this idea of pumping liquids from containers. It says to find out how much work it takes to uh, pump all or part of a liquid from a container, we imagine lifting the liquid out one thin horizontal slab at a time and applying the equation work equals force times distance to each slab. We then evaluate the integral. Um, <clears throat> this leads to as the slab becomes thinner and thinner and more thinner and more numerous. The integral we get each time depends on the weight of the liquid and the dimensions of the container, but the process is always the same. So uh, you're, what you're going to imagine for your container, the, the big thing is this idea of the getting one slice and then um, calculating kind of the volume of that one slice and then how much work it's going to take to move that. Okay. So... Um, I had to steal this from the book. I hope you can read it okay, Brandon. Um, it says, the rectangular tank shown here with its top at ground level is used to catch runoff water. Assume that the water, water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And so in the textbook, um, he, he kind of goes through that. It depends where you are in the world, how much water weighs, and it can actually be significantly different depending on, like, if you're in Melbourne versus, you know, some, somewhere in Africa. It's kind of interesting. But they, they're going to go ahead and tell you what to use for the weight of water. And you can see, if you know that water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, then clearly you're going to need to multiply this by some sort of volume in order to just get the force, which is just pounds, which is just a weight. Okay, so uh, the first question says, how much work does it take to empty the tank by pumping the water back to ground level once the tank is full? Okay, so um, what you're going to do is imagine just a typical slab here, okay? And <clears throat> you can see that if, if you set up your integran you know it's 20 feet deep, so you can go and this, set this like your y-axis, and you can this can be just any place along the y. For any arbitrary slice along the y here, you can kind of compute what the volume of that slab will be. It'll be 10 by 12 by 
this change in y, whatever that thickness is. Okay, so that will be um, your volume. So your typical slab volume is equal to, um, I'll, I'll call it a uh, change in V, 10 times 12 times the change in Y. So for any, you know, particular little width. Now, the force required to lift the slab, if you wanted to just lift that little tiny slab, would be just the weight of the slab times its volume. So, um, or it's, it's, sorry, the force required to lift the slab is just its, um, its weight. And you know that water weighs uh, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So if you multiply that 62.4 pounds per cubic foot times the volume, you'll get just um, pounds. So the force is going to be 62.4 times your delta V, or 62.4 times 120 uh, delta Y. Okay, now, um, the distance that this has to act is just going to be this arbitrary distance Y is how far it's going to have to go. And um, so the work that you have to move it is going to be y. So remember, work is equal to, well, let me say, the distance moved, the distance it will travel, the slab travels is just y. You know, it goes from here up, so that would be like y units. So, your work is equal to force times distance, which in this case is going to be 62.4 times 120, and then the distance is y, and then I'm going to put the delta y there. So that's kind of how we get our integral with, the, instead of delta y, of course, we'll have the dy. So the integral to pump out, to empty out this entire tank, we need to be moving even this little piece right at the bottom, this imaginary slab right down here at 20, has to move all the way up. So we have to go from 0 to 20, the uh, the force times the distance. So this is going to be 62.4 times 120y dy. Okay. Do you have any questions on how I got, how I set that up? Does it make sense? Is this y right here okay? What is this y from? Your conference is scheduled to end in two uh -huh. minutes. This y right here. Where did that y come from? I thought it was just is. Yeah, it's just how much you're moving. It's your it's like your distance that you're moving it. Are you still there, Brandon? Because it says I'm the only participant. I'm I'm still here. Okay. Are you okay, Brandon? With the units and stuff. Okay. The reason I'm leaving the 62. I'm not multiplying the 62.4 times 120 is because if you look later on in the question, they keep ask they ask you if you change the weight of the water. So you should see that that's all that that's going to affect is that 62.4. So that's why I'm kind of leaving it out there. Okay, well this integrand, hopefully you can do either with your calculator or um, just by hand, and you should get um, 1,497,600 foot-pounds. Okay, so let's look at um, the second question. It says, if the water is pumped to the ground level, with a 5 11 horsepower motor, work output 20, 250 foot-pounds per second, how long will it take to empty the full tank to the nearest minute? 
Okay, so it's pumping at 250 foot-pounds per second, and we've got to get 1,497,600 foot-pounds out of there. So it's going to take it some time, right? So the time it takes to pump it out is going to be the work divided by the rate that it does it. Um, your conference is now over. Goodbye. So it's going to be the work, which is 1,497,600, divided, so divided by, so these are foot-pounds, divided by the 250 foot-pounds per second. So this is another one where if you're in a science class, that's, they would really encourage you to use your units because you should see that when you calculate this, your foot-pounds cancel. You do just end up with seconds. Okay, and so if you type that into your calculator, you should get um, 5,990.4 seconds. But if you want that rounded to the nearest, um, well, they want it to the nearest minute, so... Let's see, uh, there are 3,600, let's see, I guess we could do 60, 60 seconds in one minute. It's going to be a lot, okay. And then, so 5,990.4. divided by 60 is 99.84 um, minutes. And then if you divide that by 60 again, it feels better to me. You get 1.664 um, hours. Let's see. So 99.84 minutes, which is... hours. So how are you going to get that um, that uh, well I mean whatever however you want to do that. I guess what I would do is what I would have done is I don't know how the online homework I didn't try these online if it's real honorary but like in my brain, I'm thinking 60 minutes, so I've got one hour, and then I have 39.84 minutes left, so I'm going to say one hour, 40 minutes. That's how I would do it. One hour, 40 minutes. Does that feel okay? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how picky it is. Hopefully it's not too bad. You do all that work, and it gives you a hard time about that. Okay, show that the pump in Part B will lower the water level 10 feet during the first 25 minutes of pumping. So that's Part C, what we have to do. All right, so um, what's going to happen in that is that we, what we just want to do is figure out how much force, I mean, how much work is done when it's moved the water to a level of 10 feet instead of moving it all 20 feet. And then we'll show that the time that it took for that to occur was 25 minutes. Okay, so that's probably the best strategy on that one. Okay, so C then, um, following kind of what we did, the same steps from part A, except that um, we only want to find the water level to 10 feet we're moving the water halfway which is 10 feet so um, the work is going to be the integral so instead of from 0 to 10, 20 it's 0 to 10 and you still have your 62.4 times your 120y dy. 
So that work is, if you type that into your calculator or, you know, do it. Do you want to see it? Maybe I should show you doing it one time with the calculator. You guys should be pretty good at doing this with your calculator by now, I guess. So 62. Point four times 120 x comma x comma 0 comma 10 so uh, 374,400 foot pounds Isn't that a nice round number? <laughs> and is it interesting how, how much less work? I mean, I guess it makes sense. It doesn't really to me, but <laughs> it takes it a lot longer to move that second half of the water. Does that seem weird? It takes it less work. It takes a lot more work. See, because it's going to get down to halfway in 25 minutes. Doesn't that seem strange? Pardon? Oh, no. Okay, so um, so here the time that required to do that is going to be the work divided by the rate of the pump, which is 250 foot-pounds per second. So when you type that, if you, if you compute that, you get... Um, <clears throat> So if I divide that by 250, I get 1,497.6 seconds. And if I divide that by 60, I get 24.96, about 25 minutes. So... Um, <clears throat> which is approximately 25 minutes. I don't know, it just seems strange that, you know, it's like it, almost like when you're draining the pool, it seems, to take, it seems to go down pretty far and then it takes so much longer to get the rest of it. It seems weird. Doesn't it seem weird? An hour, because it takes you another... 60 minutes almost, more than 60 minutes to get the rest of it to empty out. Yeah. Or it's just because it's, it's not as much distance, it takes less work, right? Because at first, that, moving that slab 10 is not nearly as much work as moving a slab 20. So it takes a lot more work, so. Okay. Maybe it's all intuitive to you. Okay, um, all right, now on part D it says the weight of water. What are the answers to part A and B in a location where the water weighs 62.26 pounds per cubic feet or 62.59 pounds per cubic feet? Okay, so the problem's not really going to change much except that instead of the 62.4, you're going to be using the 62.626 or 62.59. So... On D, when the water weighs 62.26 uh, uh, pounds per cubic foot, uh, the weight is going to be, if you go back up on on this integrand, well, I didn't, you can actually take this and divide by 62.4 and then multiply by the 62 point, you know, you can work your problem just replacing the 62.4 with the 62.26. Um, and so that's going to be 1,494,240 foot-pounds. 
and the time that it takes it is still going to be about one hour and 40 minutes. Dividing that by 250, your time is still one hour and 40 minutes. And then similarly for the, for the other one, The 62.59, just plug that in to part A, and you should get the work to be 1,502,000 and 160 foot-pounds, and um, the time, just a little bit more, 1 hour, 40.1 minutes. Okay, so that's not too bad. And so I don't get scared off by these problems online because even though they have little parts, they're not really they're not really too bad. All right. So example six is kind of similar. It's they like to tweak these questions a little bit. You have to think a little bit, but the basics of it are the same. All right. So um, now instead of a rectangular tank. We have a conical tank filled to within two feet of the top with olive oil that weighs 57 pounds per cubic foot. It's heavy. How much work does it take to pump the oil to the rim of the tank? Okay. So again, you just consider an arbitrary slab, and you've you got to figure out what that volume of that slab will be. And then the distance that you move it now is going to be uh, 10 minus y. That's going to be how far it's. See, this question is tweaked, right? Because on the last question, why did we just have the letter y? Well, it was because it was sunken at ground level, you know, and so we were, we were it was different our, the way our axes were set up. So this one, for an arbitrary slot, slab to get it to... The, the distance that you have to move it is going to be 10 minus y. This is the distance you move it. All right, and then they're kind enough to give us this angle here so we can figure out what the equation for this line is. And so then we can figure out this right here, this arbitrary slab to have a radius of... Um, if the equation of this line is y equals 2x, then x equals 1 half y is this, the radius. And then, obviously, the volume there is going to be pi r squared uh, dy, or delta y, which is, and your r is 1 half y. Okay, so... Um, the volume of a little slab is going to be pi r squared times its thickness, which in this case is your delta y. And so that's going to be pi times one-half y squared um, times uh, delta y, or the change in y, which is going to be our dy. Okay? And so then that's going to be pi over 4 y squared delta y. Now, your force required to lift it is going to be the weight times the weight per unit volume. So we just need to multiply that 57 pounds per cubic foot uh, times this, times the volume. So your force is going to be uh, 57 times the volume. So in this case, it's going to be 57 pi over 4 y squared delta y. Okay, and so then the distance that it has to travel again, by our picture, the distance that it travels is for the arbitrary slab, you got to move it up, and so it's going to be just 10 minus y, because it's already gone y units, so 10 minus y is the distance that it's going to be moved. So your integral, then, is going to be 
Now, we want to move it. What do we want to do? What do they tell us about it? Oh, notice that they tell us um, the tank is filled to within two feet of the top of the olive oil. Uh, oh, sorry, to within two feet of the top with olive oil. So you only, you're only moving slabs from zero to eight. Does that make sense? You, it's not completely full. So your integrand, the limits on your integrand are just going to go from zero to eight. And then um, it's going to be 57 pi over four y squared times the 10 minus y and then dy. Okay. So for me, the tricky part on understanding these was knowing why it was just from zero to eight verse, and then the 10 minus y, you know, what you want to think about is um, moving any particular, any particular slab is located from zero, between zero and eight, but the amount that it has to move is going to be the 10 minus y. Does that kind of make sense? The very, the, the very top one is still going to have to move two feet because it, it was two feet from the, or two, is it feet? Yeah, two feet. That's a big old vat of tank full of olive oil. But anyway, even this very top one still has to move two feet. So, okay. All right, so if you do this computation, which I'm not going to do because um, I know that you know how to do this, you know, distribute it out, add one, one to the exponent, put it over it, you should get approximately 30,561 foot-pounds. Okay, now let's tweak the questions a little bit and see if we can handle it. How much work would it take to pump the oil from the tank to the level of the top of the tank if the tank were completely full? Well, everything's going to stay the same except what? If the tank were completely full, what's going to happen? Instead of going from 0 to 8, you're going to go from 0 to 10 because you're going to have to move even the top one, you know, a little bit or whatever. Okay, so your work here is going to go from 0 to 10. The distance it travels is still going to be um, 10 minus y dy. Okay, so the only thing that changes is that because it's completely full, it's going to be from 0 to 10. And that is, if you compute that, it's approximately 37,306. Okay? And then C, what about if you want to pump the oil in part A to a level three feet above the cone's rim? All right, we want to move it three feet above. So you're still, in part A, we only had, it was only from zero to eight. It was, it was two feet below. But we want to move it up to three feet above, right? So now instead of 10 minus y, we will have 13 minus y. Does that make sense? So it's... In part A, they're still dealing with part A, which is it's filled to within two feet of the top. So we're still going to integrate from zero to eight on this, but instead of um, instead of doing ten minus y, we're going to have to do thirteen minus y. So the distance traveled by an arbitrary slab is going to change. So you're still going to go from zero to eight because it was two feet from the rim, but and this part is going to be the same and the y squared, but the distance that it has to travel because it's three feet above the cone's rim is going to become 13 minus y, dy. Okay? And if you compute that, you should get uh, 53,482.5 foot-pounds. Okay. The last idea in this section is this idea of work and kinetic energy. And they do a little derivation. This is taken from your textbook. Um, it says, if a variable force of magnitude f of x moves a body mass m along the x-axis, 
from x1 to x2, the body's velocity can be written as the change in x with respect to time, where t represents time, dx dt. And you can use Newton's second law of motion. Do you guys remember f equals ma as one of the, I don't know if you've heard of it. As, and, and a is acceleration, which is the rate of change of velocity, so dv dt, and the chain rule. And so dv dt can be thought of as dv dx dx dt. Well, um, <clears throat> dx dt, of course, is just your velocity um, times dv dx. And so what happens here is that um, you can get the net work done by the force in moving the body from x1 to x2 is just going to be the integral from x1 to x2. Um, the force times dx, which is going to be equal to one-half mv2 squared minus one-half mv1 squared, where v1 and v2 are the body's velocities at x1 and x2. And, and in physics, the expression one-half mv squared is called the kinetic energy of the body of the mass m moving with velocity v, Therefore, the work done by the force equals the change in the body's kinetic energy, and we can find the work by calculating this change. So this is the formula that you're going to use in order to compute the work um, done. And you may have seen that. I kind of remember in physics, you get that, you get that equation. They don't necessarily always derive it for you, but you do get that equation. Okay. So these two problems, we don't have to integrate. Yay, we just have to use our formula. It says, um, a, a 1.6 ounce golf ball is driven off the tee at a speed of 280 feet per second, about 191 miles per hour. How many foot pounds of work are done by the ball getting it into the air? Okay, so your formula for work is one-half mvt2 squared minus one-half m v one squared. Well, here, it's, it's driven off the t, right? So that tells you that v1 is equal to zero, right? Because it's from rest. And your v2 is the uh, speed, that 280 feet per second. So um, you do have to convert the mass into... Um, into the correct units, and this may be uh, something that you haven't seen before, but uh, 1.6 ounces is, okay, so the weight is uh, 1.6 ounces, right? And um, there, that is, there are 16 ounces in a pound, right? So this is... Um, 0.1 pounds, and the mass is, um, if you know the weight, um, which is the force, to find the mass, you divide by acceleration, because force equals mass times acceleration. So uh, to get the mass... You divide the force by um, the acceleration. So this is F. And your acceleration here, since we're dealing in feet per second, is the acceleration due to gravity. which is 32 feet per second squared, right? Okay, so um, we're going to take our force, which is 0.1 pounds, and we're going to divide by our acceleration. That's going to give us our mass, which we're going to be able to plug into this equation. And then we have our velocity is the 280 feet per second. Okay, so our mass is going to be equal to 0.1 pounds divided by 32 feet per second squared. And if you type that into your calculator or just do, this is one hundredth over uh, 32, I'm sorry, one tenth over 32, so this is one over 320. Okay, who knows what the unit is, pounds 
per foot per second squared or pounds second squared per foot. I'll only be impressed. Can you impress me with the unit? It's not. It's called a. Pardon? No. Brandon, you got a guess? Have we had a physics class? Pounds per second. Yeah, we got a second squared, and it's it's pounds second squared per foot, not foot pounds. Oh. It's called a slug. Maybe I've heard, that, uh, so there you go. Now you know. It's a slug. <laughs> and it is, the unit there is pound second squared per foot, which is, I guess, a slug. Okay. And so um, finally, so the hard part on this problem was actually converting it into the right units. The actual math is not that bad because we just get to apply this formula. The work is going to be one half, and this is one over 320 times the velocity, and so the velocity was 280 feet per second. And see, if you do it like this, instead of calling it a slug, if you put this, um, this is going to be a point, or see, let's see, 1 over 320, and so then this is going to be, um, pounds, seconds, squared over feet. You see the feet are going to cancel. I think we, we square this, right? We square this. So um, the seconds, uh, oh, and that squared needs to be, sorry. That seconds there. Okay, so your seconds are going to cancel, um, and one of your feet is going to cancel, and you are just going to end up with foot pounds, which is your unit for work. So um, if you multiply this all out, you should get um, 122.5 foot pounds. So in actuality, you didn't need to know that uh, a pound per second squared per foot is a slug, but it does make you cool, and someday you might use that information like on who wants to be a millionaire or something like that. I don't know. Maybe not. Okay. I tried to pick examples that, that maybe you could have a sense of, I don't know if you've ever played golf, or this one's a tennis tennis example, I thought maybe. There was a soft <laughs> there was a softball example too, but I don't know. So it's during the match in which Pete Sampras won the 1990 U.S. Open Men's Tennis Championship, Sampras hit a serve that was clocked at a phenomenal 124 miles per hour. How much work did Sampras have to do on the two-ounce ball to get it to that speed? Okay, so um, let's find out what had to happen there. Okay, first of all, we need to get our weight, and we need to get our our weight so that we can get our mass. Okay, so our weight is two ounces. Remember, there's 16 pounds in an ounce, so that is um, one eighth of a pound. We've got to get it to pounds. Now, our mass again is force is equal to mass times acceleration, so mass is equal to force divided by acceleration, where your force is your weight, so that one-eighth pound divided by your acceleration, which is the pull of gravity, 32 feet per second squared. So that gets you your slug, um, which is 100 and 200, 1 over 256 slugs. Okay, now um, we've got to convert the 124 miles per hour into feet per second. 124 miles in one hour. You might remember that there are 5,280 feet in one mile, and there are uh, 36, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, in one hour, there are. 3,600 seconds. So our miles will cancel, our hours will cancel, we'll end up with feet per second. So that is approximately 181.87 
feet per second. Can you imagine? I mean, what are you going to do? You're just going to let that bad boy go. I mean, you're going to hit that back? I don't think so. It'll whack you. I'd get out of the way is what I'd do. That thing was coming at me at 187, 181.87 feet per second. I'd be scared. <laughs> you could have the championship. All right. So the weight, again, your V V1 is zero because it's from the start. He's hitting it. You know, probably, I guess, just throwing it up in the air, but we can assume it's zero. And so it's going to be that one half, and then you do the M and then the V2 squared minus one half and V1 squared, but here this is zero. And so we have one half and then our mass was the one over 256 and then our 181.87 seconds. And so if you compute this all out, you get 64.6 foot-pounds. So the moral to this story, all right, Pete Sampras is, you know, rocking awesome. He wins the U.S. Open. He can slam a jamma with his serve, 124 miles per hour, takes him 64.6 foot-pounds of work, right? So if you come all the way back to that subway car question, you know, when I was saying I didn't really have a sense of what it was required there um, to compress the, or the, the work, let's see, the work required to compress it half an inch was, well, uh, now see these are in inch pounds, 905 inch pounds. So how would we convert those to foot pounds? 905 inches per pound. So um, there's, uh, <laughs> we want to cancel the inches and get to foots, right? So that's 12 inches in every one foot. So 905 divided by 12 is 75.4 75.4 foot pounds and what was Pete what was his well see he could almost he almost had enough force because he had 64.6 foot pounds to to get that that's how much work it took him to move that tennis ball at 75.4. He could, if he wanted to, if he worked out just a little harder, he could also move, you know, the spring assembly on the subway half an inch. So he's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why he would want to do that because you don't get paid nearly as much money as you do if you win the U.S. Open. But it looks like he might have the strength to do it. So that's good for him. And I mean, and actually, though, it's, it's, it's the whole movement of his body and everything that he's using to get that to get that work, or to, to accomplish that work. I don't know. Whatever. There's my story. I think the big deal is, thank God for machines. Okay. So, um, you okay, Brandon? Yes, ma'am. I can't get this to stop.